Picking up where he left off, across the galaxy, Jedi die. Back at home, Vader is stomping through the Jedi Temple with the 501st causing all kinds of death and destruction that we get to see more of. Padme and the other senators can see the destruction from miles away. She sends Bail Organa and another senator to investigate and help however they can. Meanwhile, Vader comes across the younglings hiding in the council chambers. And I've been really torn about how to handle this scene. On the one hand, I don't think any father-to-be would slaughter a room full of children in cold blood, and I think it's a little early to show Vader do something so evil. Like, yeah, is he leading a mass execution right now? Yes. But killing a room full of kids, pretty much with your bare hands, is something else entirely. And on the other hand, it does do a good job showing how far he's fallen and how far he could go now. So we'll split the difference here. The kids plead with Vader to help. He kneels down to the child's eye level, reassuring him and the others that everything will be alright. He's conflicted. It shows on his face. This is very hard for him, but he has no choice now. Vader tells them to sleep peacefully, and he uses the Force to render all of them unconscious. He exits the room where a handful of troopers are waiting. Vader lets them go in, but orders them to make it clean and quick. It's his way of being gentle about it. He's joined the dark side, but he's not totally a heartless monster yet. After all, he was a Jedi Knight just like an hour ago. Bail Organa and his fellow senator arrive at the temple, demanding an end to the violence and the dispersal of the crowd. The clones don't comply, telling them to leave the area instead. The other senator forces the issue, going so far as to try and get past the clones, which gets him thrown to the ground and taken into custody. The crowd below goes wild at that. Organa and the rest of his group is not well liked at all by many people, including the ones down there. Bail leaves the scene, but not before he sees a young Padawan cut down, prompting a few more cheers from the crowd. Yoda escapes from Kashyyyk. Do we need Chewbacca? Not really, no. Am I leaving him in? Sure, he's not hurting anybody. Bail Organa returns to Padme and the other senators and tells them what happened. They don't know what to say at this point. Padme pushes through the shock and takes charge. She dispatches Bail to intercept and rescue any Jedi he can, since he has the fastest ship. They all disperse, leaving Padme alone with her thoughts. She wants to break down, but wills herself to hold it together. 3PO offers to put in an inquiry about Anakin to make sure he's okay. Padme can't stop the tears from falling now. As if miles away, she tells 3PO no. Vader returns home then, tears falling down his own face. He tells her what has happened. The Jedi Order tried to overthrow the Republic. He stopped them from assassinating the Chancellor himself, and he just subdued the Jedi at the temple. This can't be real, but she's more inclined to believe it because Vader himself does so strongly. Their bond in the Force cuts both ways. She asks what happens next, and he reiterates his first priority is to make sure she and the baby are safe, and that's why he needs to go on one more mission. After that, they will finally be free to live in a galaxy at peace. She asks where he's going, but Vader refuses to say. Bail rendezvous with Yoda and then Obi-Wan. This catastrophe is apparently happening all across the galaxy. All clones are turning against their Jedi generals simultaneously, and the temple is now broadcasting a message calling all members of the Order home. So they need to return to the temple, put a stop to it, and find out what's going on. For all they know, Republic High Command could have been sabotaged or the Chancellor was deposed by a rogue faction. Meanwhile, Sidious tells the Separatist leaders to expect a special guest who will take care of them. Bail and the Jedi return to Coruscant. The Chancellor has called a special session of Congress. Could this be about what's happening with the clones? Have they gone completely rogue? If the Republic can't control its forces, have they just lost the war? Too many questions. One thing is clear. Nobody can know Yoda and Obi-Wan are there. Vader arrives on Mustafar, and things are not looking good for these guys. Obi-Wan and Yoda are greeted by a horrible scene inside the temple. Bodies of their fellow Jedi lie dead everywhere. They both feel a dark and suffocating presence all around them. Whatever happened here was not just tragic. It was a focal point for a cosmic shift in the balance of the Force itself. To add to that, many of the people here were cut down by a lightsaber. The mysterious Darth Sidious may have been here, finally coming out of hiding. Or worse, one of their own may have done this themselves. But what kind of person could do this? 
this guy. He's getting pretty good at this kind of thing. Bale enters the Senate chamber midway through. Padme asks if he's found any Jedi out there, to which he says no. Palpatine declares victory over the Separatists, but that their work is just getting started. The Jedi Rebellion shows that the roots of treachery run deep, and that the rot within the Republic has spread too far to be excised. That same rot allowed for the recent splintering of the galaxy in the first place, and the devastating war that followed it. For too long, his predecessors ignored the problem, content with being custodians of stagnation and decay. But that changes now. Never again will this be allowed to happen. Never again will the people's government be allowed to be paralyzed by special interests and indecision. The people do not deserve that. The people deserve greatness, safety, security. The people don't deserve a bureaucracy. They deserve an empire, and the applause in the Senate chamber is so thunderous that Palpatine's next words are in danger of being drowned out. The First Galactic Empire. People across the city cheer their new emperor's words being broadcast across the hollow net. So this is how liberty dies. The blood drains from Bale's face. It's over, he says. The Republic is dead. Hope is lost. But. Padme looks at him more resolved than ever. Their work is just beginning. Obi-Wan recalibrates the beacon. Their mission is done. He checks the security recording, scrubbing through scenes of carnage that shake him to his core, and he finally sees Vader. How can this be? Then they see the aftermath, with Sidious giving Vader a new assignment. Vader has purged himself of mercy and has seen firsthand the weakness of the Jedi. Now for his next lesson, he will go to the Mustafar system, destroy the Separatist leaders, and see what kind of sniveling treachery they cannot let develop in their new world order. Palpatine is Darth Sidious? He was in control the whole time? The droids? The war? Everything? And Anakin is his new apprentice? Yoda helps him pull himself together. Now is not the time. The light is dying, but has not run out. If they can destroy the Sith here and now, perhaps the galaxy can still be saved from a thousand years of darkness. Obi-Wan knows he can't kill Anakin though. He must still be in there somewhere. Surely he can be brought back from the dark side. Yoda does not share his optimism. Obi-Wan is welcome to try, he says, but not to endanger this critical mission. Padme gets back to her apartment. Re Feeling from the Emperor's speech still, Obi-Wan steps out of hiding. With surprising dexterity, Padme whips out a blaster from her cloak. Turns out, she's carried one ever since the battle for Naboo. She hates what Palpatine's doing, but remember that Vader's conviction against the Jedi fed into her point of view. Right now, she thinks the Jedi really are not to be trusted. Eventually, Obi-Wan talks her down by appealing to their friendship, their shared history, and how much they both care for and are worried about Anakin. She puts the blaster away and hears him out. He lays out everything he's learned about Darth Sidious, the war, all of it. When he gets to the parts about Anakin, deep inside she knows it's true. She's felt the darkness within him, the desperation, the anger, and hate. Anakin is very sick. Obi-Wan asks for her help. He knows all about his feelings for her. In fact, he knows about their connection, their force bond. When he sensed it before, it was faint but unmistakable, and he imagines he only felt it because of his friendship with them. In the end, Padme agrees to go with him to save this person who means so much to both of them. A little footnote in case you missed it, in this version, it's Obi-Wan who knows where Anakin is because of the security recording. Before leaving, Padme tasks Bail with convening their allies at Polis Massa, a secure location to discuss next steps. She will join them shortly, hopefully with good news. Obi-Wan lets Padme talk to Anakin herself when they get to Mustafar. His presence right off the bat could be counterproductive with Anakin having turned against the Jedi. Vader is surprised to see her and hugs her tight. But then he asks hesitantly how she found him and why she's here. In fact, she shouldn't be here. She could give birth any day now. She tells him about what's going on back home and that she wants him to come home with her. She's scared for him. Anakin needs to leave all this behind, go to Naboo like they planned. But Vader can't do that. Not now, he says. He's gone through too much to abandon his duty now. The Empire needs him. Without him, people like the Separatist leaders could gain another foothold and tear it down all over again. They have to be decisive, unwavering, 
if they want to maintain their hard-won peace. Isn't Anakin's loyalty to her? Padme asks. This is all for her, he responds, getting aggravated. Isn't she grateful? She never wanted any of this, she says. All she wanted was to be with him. They go back and forth, Vader's anger rising as Padme delves into what she's learned about him and what he's done. She wasn't supposed to know any of that, Vader thinks. How could she? How dare she? Padme can feel his anger, but continues to appeal to the good piece of Anakin that she knows is in there. But he's too twisted at this point to hear it. To him, everything he's done has been for the greater good. Not even Padme's influence right now is enough to sway him back. Their bond is not working. It gets to the point where Padme gives Vader an ultimatum. Abandon his course and leave with her, or he won't see her ever again. This angers Vader to the point where he force chokes her, blind with rage. He then goes in to strike her, but Padme is quickly and suddenly pulled back by an unseen force, saved. She comes to a stop in Obi-Wan's arm. He ignites his lightsaber with his other hand in a protective stance. Vader ignites his own blade, demanding Obi-Wan to give Padme back. Instead, Obi-Wan guides her safely to the ship and beckons her to get on, keeping Vader at bay. When she's safely on board, Obi-Wan can only manage to ask Vader why. Why did he do this? Vader says Obi-Wan would not understand. He had no choice. But Obi-Wan does not accept that, retorting that you always have a choice. Did Anakin learn nothing? On the contrary, Vader says, he's learned everything. He learned why the Council hated him, why the Jedi had to be put down, what kind of people foster rebellion, and what kind of resolve was needed to deal with them. And soon he will learn how to become more powerful than any Jedi to have ever existed. Obi-Wan can't believe what has become of his friend. Was this always inside Anakin, he asks? In a surprising moment of introspection, Vader says that maybe Anakin died a long time ago, maybe the day he left home. Obi-Wan pushes against that. Anakin is a good man, he just needs help. He begs him to come home, like a parent trying to save their child. He's sorry for not seeing this sooner, for not being there for Anakin when he needed him, but now he's ready to do whatever it takes to bring him back. Vader looks as if he may be considering Obi-Wan's words for a second, but his expression turns hostile fast. He says he will never be shackled again and to get out of his way. And that's it. The line is drawn. Obi-Wan stands firm. There is no chance he'll let Vader onto that ship. He says, in that case, he will do what he must. Vader's final response, darkly sarcastic, Yes, Master. And the duel gets underway. I really have no notes for either fight. Both are outstanding. You really get the impression with Anakin and Obi-Wan's fight, especially that both men are trying to end the fight with each swing. At the end of their duel, Obi-Wan is standing on the banks by the river of lava. Rather than flexing on having the high ground, Obi-Wan deliberately leads Vader into trying the same maneuver he did on Darth Maul, putting the fight directly in the Force's hands, simply dropping into a tired-looking fighting stance that Vader can't resist. He thinks the fight is over. Vader takes the bait and gets disarmed. Obi-Wan's speech stays similar to how it is now, only adding that Anakin was his family. The Order was his world, and now he has nothing. Neither of them do. Was it worth it? Was it? Vader is too consumed by rage to even respond. Obi-Wan says he loved Anakin, and that is why he must do this. He takes up Anakin's lightsaber, ready to commit the final blow. When Vader catches fire, it's a terrible fate. Obi-Wan can't bear to watch as the flames take him. He rejoins a healthy and not dying Padme on her ship. Broken and devastated, all they can do for a modicum of solace is share an emotional hug. Obi-Wan apologizes to Padme profusely, practically confessing to her that he failed Anakin. Padme reassures him though that it wasn't his fault. Anakin chose his path himself. And the little bit of good that was still in him at the end was only strong enough to endure and stand against the darkness was because of Obi-Wan. He doesn't quite believe her though. Was there really any goodness left in him? Yes, Padme says. She felt it. Sidious arrives right in the nick of time to save his apprentice. The gang arrives at Polis Massa, where Bail, Yoda, and the other senators are waiting. They get to work planning their next steps. Meanwhile, Sidious arrives with Vader back at Coruscant. It doesn't look good. The medical droids are doing what they can, 
but they're losing him. Bader lies on the medical table so close to death. Sidious kneels down close to Vader's face. In a low voice, he tells Vader he has a final lesson to teach him. The power to cheat death. He talks him through it, painting an image of Vader being trapped in the dark, cold void. So cold, he can barely breathe or feel his limbs. His inner light is fading. When it goes out, the darkness will take him and he will cease to be. But there is a bright, shining light in the distance. Vader must go to it, draw from it. Across the galaxy, Padme falters and collapses. Something is very wrong. She's in distress, so much that they decide they need to induce birth to save the child. Sidious pushes the nearly lifeless Vader to go on, draw from the light. Focus on your will to live, and the light will sustain you. Do not let death come for you this day. Padme's condition is worsening at an alarming rate. The medical droids can't figure out what's wrong with her. The babies are in danger as well. Babies? That's right, she's having twins. Yoda senses that something is very wrong with the force within Padme. He doesn't know why or how, but he believes that to be the cause. Can they stop it? Obi-Wan asks. To sustain the life force of another is a little known, yet massively powerful technique. Yoda says. Obi-Wan would not be able to do it, but Yoda could. But even he can't save all three of them, Padme and the children. It's got to be either Padme or the twins. Padme musters up the strength to tell them to save her children, and Yoda gets to work. As Vader siphons off more and more of the light, his own luminance is restored as the other one, which used to be so bright and glorious, dims and shrinks more and more. The twins come into the world, Luke, and then Leia. As each one is born, Obi-Wan does his best to look so happy and give Padme the joy and magic she deserves for this moment. But he knows he's saying goodbye to her at the same time. He goes to show Leia to her mother, but Padme can't see at this point. Everything is dark. She asks Obi-Wan to describe her. Choking back the tears, he does just so. Leia is the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. She's perfect, just like her brother. She's strong and kind, just like her mother. She takes care of her brother, just as he does for her. Obi-Wan shifts into painting a picture of the twins growing up, the things they would do, the people they'd become. He's not seeing the future or anything, but rather just giving Padme the gift of seeing her children grow up happy as she slips away. Vader has taken in all the light from in front of him. He awakens, coming back to life, and taking his first breath from behind his mask, every one of which from now on, was stolen from another. Vader asks what is happening. He can't feel his body. It hurts to breathe. Sidious briefly explains that the procedure was necessary to save him, and he will grow accustomed to it. Perhaps, in time. Where is Padme? Vader asks. Can he see her? Sidious has no sympathy when he tells Vader she is gone. She is dead. At first, Vader says he doesn't believe this, but he does not sense her anymore. He can't feel her. He realizes what happened and lashes out at Sidious. He promised to protect her. Vader goes in to grab him. Sidious unleashes his power on him, using the force to violently throw Vader back into the vertical medical table once, twice, three times, and proceeds to exert more and more crushing pressure on him. Vader struggles to breathe, taking quicker, shallower breaths. He's terrified and powerless. Gone is the confidant and friend. Dripping with disdain and contempt, he tells Vader that he promised him the power to cheat death, which he granted, and in return, he now has a shell of a man for an apprentice. If there were any viable alternatives left, he would have let Vader die, but for now, Vader will serve him in pain and agony until the day comes when Sidious finally demands his death. He finally lets go. Vader is so weak he can barely hold himself up. His breathing slowly starts returning to normal. He hangs his head, defeated. Sidious looks at him with a sneer, then goes to leave. As he does, Vader asks him a question. It was him the whole time, wasn't it? Everything he saw and heard, it was him. Sidious neither confirms nor denies this. He simply looks back for a minute and then exits the room.
The atmosphere at Polis Massa is somber. Bale and the other senators are downtrodden, with Leia in Bale's arms being the only bright spot looking around at everyone around her. Yoda and Obi-Wan, with the sleeping Luke in his arms, are on the viewing deck. What will they do with the children, Obi-Wan asks. If the Force is strong enough in them, should they be trained? They could take the twins far away and restart the Order in secret. Yoda thinks on it, and then asks what does he think is right for these children. Yoda does not often defer to someone else's judgment. Obi-Wan looks down at Luke with the same glint in his eye he gave Anakin back on the invisible hand. After thinking about it, maybe even picturing the scenes he painted for Padme, he says they should give the twins a family. Yoda agrees, but they should be split up, lest the Empire find them. Where will Leia go? To a family on Naboo? No. Yoda has noticed Bale already has a special connection with her. She will go with the Organa family and Yoda senses Bale will not refuse. What about Luke? Obi-Wan thinks about it. Maybe it's because it's where he first met Anakin. Maybe it's because Anakin said that leaving it was when he started dying, but he suggests Tatooine, the Lars family. Yoda is pleased. Leia, Organa, and Luke Lars they will be. Obi-Wan, not taking his eyes off Luke, shakes his head thoughtfully and says, Luke Skywalker. Meanwhile, the Senators are in danger of fracturing. Padme was their de facto leader, and now she is gone. Without her, there is no hope. But Bale, looking at the infant Leia in his arms, refuses to lay down and die. He strengthens his comrades' resolve using Padme's legacy. As queen, Padme stood against the Trade Federation when they stole her home. All seemed lost, but she rallied allies from all corners of society to her cause and showed the galaxy that yes, it was possible to stand against an evil empire and win. She already showed them the way long ago. They will be her legacy. Luke is now sleeping peacefully in a bassinet with R2 standing watch over him. Obi-Wan is still conferring with Yoda, talking about going into hiding. They will adopt the tactic the Sith used against them, biding their time, letting the world believe the Jedi to be extinct until the time is right. Where will they go? Obi-Wan asks. Yoda says they must choose separate locations unknown to the other for safety's sake. When the Force is ready for them to rise again, they will find each other. Obi-Wan muses on how hard isolation will be, and that's when Yoda broaches the subject he's been waiting to get to. An old friend has learned how to reach out from the netherworld of the Force. His old master. Yoda has been in contact with him for a short while, actually. Qui-Gon's voice is then heard, telling Obi-Wan he won't have to be alone, and then he materializes in front of them. It's a powerful reunion. Obi-Wan's shock gives way to pure, unqualified happiness at seeing his old father figure. When he asks how this is possible, Qui-Gon responds that anything is possible with the living force, and there's so much to teach his old apprentice. These two Jedi started the trilogy side by side, and they end it side by side. The rest of the film plays out largely like normal. It's an amazingly poignant end sequence. My one change comes when Darth Vader joins the Emperor on the bridge of their Star Destroyer. Their ship is seen to be in orbit around a planet with many moons. The planet is Endor. We're getting a glimpse at what Palpatine has been funneling resources to all this time. We see the Death Star midway through construction and further away a second one at an even earlier stage of development. Leia settles into her new home, Obi-Wan drops Luke off with his family, we end on the twin sunset. The end. I hope you enjoyed the punch-up here, or at least parts of it. Maybe it's perfect already. Maybe your version is better. I'd love to hear what punch-ups you'd make to my draft, or how you would change the movie in general if it needs anything at all. And while you're doing that, grab a like on your way out and subscribe to the channel. That'd be awesome. Uh, consider joining the channel and becoming a real tough guy. I got some merchandise as well that you're welcome to take a peek at. Anything and everything to support the channel here is really appreciated. For now, stay tough and stop by again sometime.